<laughs> hey folks, I'm here with Paul Ramsey. Is that how you Hi. would be yeah. prepared to be known? I, I go, most, most people know me by Ramsey Paul, R-A-M-Z-P-A-U-L. I, I make videos and stuff, so yeah, my real name is Paul Ramsey. Go. Clever, huh, Ramsey Paul? Yeah, very clever. <laughs> so how are you doing? Grand. Grand. Right. Keeping away from the wind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you've been... Uh, terrorism. I, I think things are happening in Paris, aren't they? Uh huh. The, so the whole you, uh, continent is freaking out. Yeah. Do you have much of uh, that problem in uh, Ireland, or you, any worries of that of terrorism, or any radical Islam there at all, or is it still? Are you still not enriched in that area yet? Not not as densely as most places. Uh, as ex the ex most extreme that has gotten, I've seen a few Muslims with a little table out in the high street trying to convert people. But that's about okay. It. But you don't have like no go areas. Like I, I heard parts of London. If you're like a white person, you can't even go in anymore because it's dangerous. So mm. it's not that bad. In uh, are you in Dublin? Near Dublin? I'm on the opposite side on the west coast, oh, okay. Galway. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're so a very a artsy kind of liberal city. Oh, okay. And uh, Dublin's more uh, industrial, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More condensed poverty there. So, where if, if there's going to be trouble with immigration, it's going to be there. Right. Well, I I read it. Yeah, I heard that uh, Ireland is facing a lot of immigration. Right? It, aren't they projecting in the future Ireland will no longer be Irish? Is that the projections I've heard? Before the recent deluge, mm -hmm. uh, the project projection was twenty five years from now. Mm -hmm. But I imagine that it will be much sooner now that we have the Syrian situation and the East African situation. Oh uh, yeah. So, are you taking your country being uh, getting a lot of the Syrian immigrants, or not that many? We are only expecting about five hundred by the end of next year, which is fantastic. Or at least yeah. in that one center that I read about. I'm, I'm not sure um, Morgan can help us out on that one. Yeah, we're, we're, there's a big controversy here in the states where we just found out Obama said promised to take in like a hundred thousand uh, refugees, but all the state governors are trying to refuse them. <laughs> so it's like a big debate now. <laughs> yeah, even because... CNN has uh, said that more than more than half of the nation's governors have said no, thank you. Right. Although technically that's just symbolic because it's kind of the federal government can trump our state governments. I think we had a war about that in this country years ago. <laughs> and uh, is it is it that that's that way for you? With are you you're part of the EU, right? So the EU can just trump your laws and policies. Is that true? Yeah, we, we're in the same position as your state is in when it comes All to right. the federal government. Right. So you can try to refuse it, but then the EU would just trump you, and that'd be it. Yep. That's it. The beautiful European Union. <laughs> is there any is there any activism in your country to pull out of that? I've I've heard of, you know, um the Britain there's been their the UKIP is it? They've been active trying to pull out of the EU. Is there any rumblings in Ireland about that? Yeah. Uh we have a fledgling political party, Identity Ireland. They set up shop. Um just this year but the problem is that, that you know they kind of look kind of disheveled and kind of dangerous so they're kind of fulfilling that stereotype of the you know the skinhead or the hick oh, out in the okay. middle of nowhere yeah yeah we call that the 1488 crowd here but i know what you mean yeah <laughs> that they so. front like they're you know progressive and they're okay but you know, I've heard stories that they're misogynistic and racist, so they're not going to uh -huh. fare well in the court of public opinion. Right. Interesting. A British listener pipes in on the live 
live stream chat and calls UK IP Jukip. <laughs> yeah, that's int- it's kind of interesting all, all the, what's happening in there. So, so is Ireland mostly? Uh, are, are you guys? Is there kind of a big nationalist focus besides that group, or is it, um, or not so much? Historically, we're going through a lull because for the past hundred or a few hundred years, our whole country has been centered around nationalism. And the youth have gotten sick of that. They've become jaded. So any kind of nationalist revival is yet to come, you know? To me, I mean, I'm an outsider. I'm just from America. But to me, it seems ironic that it seems like you guys had this whole struggle for centuries, right, against the English and now you just get in with the EU. It's like, you know, get rid of one boss and get a new boss. It's, it seems like you, you guys would want your independence as a nation. So after all that struggles for hundreds of years. Yeah, really. It feels like a bit of a letdown. And I think as it becomes more apparent what is really at stake here, then we will see a revival. Um on the question of refugees, uh, my producer just piped in here that we've agreed to take in 4,000 of them, and after family reunification, it will be around 20,000. And right. as some perspective here, we are a nation of 4.3 million, and 20% of that aren't even ethnic Irish. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, what's interesting about those refugees is, you know, how many Israel's taken? Zero. Yep, you guessed. <laughs> <laughs> and and when asked about it, it's because, well, we, we need to keep our nation, you know, ethnically Jewish. So, I you know, and I just don't know why more Western countries don't do that. One country I visited a lot, and I really admire them, is Hungary. They've pretty much resisted that altogether, the EU and all their quotas. And Poland just recently, I don't know if you saw that, they've rejected their uh, uh, quotas to take these refugees. So I think there's some resistance, but most of the resistance is, ironically, is in what used to be former communist countries in Eastern Europe, whereas Western Europe seems uh, pretty weak to try to resist any of this. I have a theory about that. Um, What's that? Those people have been fighting, 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 particularly the Polish especially during World War Two, they've always been fighting for their own territory and now you have this complete third party out of nowhere just coming in it's it's not going to fly you know right yeah and I, I the Irish uh, was always pretty peaceful I believe like I don't believe Ireland was involved with World War Two, and did they have some national socialist sympathies or uh, no, it was unfashionable to um, do that because we were strictly Republican socialist, you know, we were Marxist to the core. However, uh, the Nazis did bomb Cork, uh, one of our biggest cities, and then they later apologized. So that was cool of them. <laughs> Yeah, that was nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to remember my history. I don't remember uh, Ireland being embroiled much in the war, so good for Ireland, I guess. So, yeah, the Eastern Europeans, they have a different attitude, that's for sure. And I, I think a little bit ironically is because they were under communism, they were pretty much spared or behind a lot of the multiculturalism that we have in the West. And if you go back there, like when I visit Romania or Hungary, uh, have you have you visited those countries no, I would recommend it if you get a chance. It's like kind of going back in time in a lot of ways. They're uh, still a little bit more traditional. They don't have. I just saw in Ireland, right? You guys have gay marriage now, right? That just came in. Uh, I, yeah. I, yeah, and see, that wouldn't even be considered in like Hungary or Romania or anything like that. They couldn't even fathom something like that. So they're kind of in a really. They, I think, communism in, in a strange sort of way protected them from a lot of the. Uh, you know the the cultural Marxist concepts, ironically. So mm. they uh, tend to be a little bit more c- conservative from a social point of view. 
Although it's changing, obviously, with the, you know the globalism, but I, I still think they resist that to quite a quite a degree. Hmm. As I was going about my day today, I, I saw the most horrible image ever. I, I saw a mocha-coloured man. He had very short hair. He had a very uniform skin and and it looked like he spent three hours on his face before he left the house he had very very clean clothes very neat and his pants you could see that <clears throat> as his uh leg you know as you look down further his legs just got thinner and thinner and then you had these little baby feet and he was holding a takeaway cup and I, I thought, Jesus, what a cartoon character! You know, what right. what, what an archetype! Was this um, President Obama or? <laughs> Just kidding. Go ahead. Well, 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 well you know that, that that's it. You know, that's what the uh, image is now of manhood. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it is kind of a little bit. Um, is that is that the way in Ireland? Because. I, I, you know, I, I don't know about Ireland. I just remember the we used to have the commercials here in the seventies about Irish Spring, and the Irish people were always considered really tough. I, and I don't know if they still are the men, you know, fighters and drinkers. Um, is that no longer true, or have you guys become more of the metrosexuals like so many in the West have? We are really leaning towards the metrosexual side of things. Yeah. Oh wow! Because you know the old image, at least we had in America, were you know the tough boxers and brawlers and all that so it's interesting that has changed and again it's in all Easter, the war but... and if the war didn't get you then the alcoholism did and yeah you know. yeah it's genocide that's what it is yep yep and um well i think a lot too is you got to figure in the previous century so many of our people were really wiped out with wars you know between our own people like in world war one and world war two just think of how many men uh died in that it really kind of culled the herd so to speak and, and now we haven't had a war like that in so long it's been a few generations so i think that has changed maybe the psychology of people a little bit i think you had to be tougher back then really to survive uh, and uh, so it's changed a little bit I think that's the main thing that's acting against us when it comes to facing something like the deluge, as I call it, of mm -hmm. Islamification of Europe. We really don't know what we're in for. Like the East European people, you know, they're tough, they're body centered, they're body conscious. Mm -hmm. You know, that they know that other people have different ideas, they have different approaches to life and Sometimes you need to fight with them. Uh, the archetype right. of the um, the androgene has uh, really taken over. Um, my assistant producer, who would have really liked to be here he has uh, mm -hmm. given me a few questions uh, that he would like to have answered sure um and, and i quite like them myself um and here's a good one uh, you know when at what point did your political views transition towards the alternative right uh, probably a few years ago. I mean, I started out actually as a kid. I was conservative. I, I actually subscribed to a magazine called National Review. And so I was more of a traditional Republican for a long time. And then when I went into college, I became more of a libertarian type, influenced by Ayn Rand and that sort of thing. And then as I got older, I just started to see more of the importance of culture and how the traditional Republicans here, at least in the United States, are concerned about 
Um, well, foreign policy, our number one foreign policy is to do whatever Israel wants us to do. Because if you watch the Republican debates, it's just ridiculous. They just all say they're willing to fight for Israel, whatever Israel wants. We got to get rid of Assad, or we can't. We got to stop Iran. That's always their big number one thing. And their number two thing is economic is mostly like tax cuts. Like we Republicans, we want to tax, reduce taxes. But other than that, there's not much difference from the Democrats, except they're just a, a few years behind, meaning uh, like gay marriage thing in the United States. That happened so fast. Just a few years ago, if you remember, President Obama, a Democrat president, was opposed to gay marriage, and pretty much most everyone was. Then all of a sudden he was for it, and now most of the Republicans are for it too. So it's, it's the Overton window, I think they call it, has always been going to the left. And so the alt-right is the first group I've seen that we're not buying the premise of the left, because that's the biggest problem is when you buy the premise of the left, um, you, you keep going down that road. And the alt-right has a different view of the whole, of everything, society, economics, and the whole bit. So I, I see that as a change. So at least here in the United States, the people that are young that are involved on the right wing tend to be on, on the alt-right. Uh, the mainstream Republicans tend to be older and not as effective. And you could even argue our, our candidate, Dan, uh, Donald Trump, who's got is leading in the polls for the Republicans, he's very much influenced by alt-right con uh, concepts, you know, standing against immigration, building a wall, that we need to survive as a people, and uh, that type of thing. It's, he's not as focused on the traditional Republicans, you know, what should be the tax rate, stuff like that. So it's kind of a change, and we've seen it in our uh, society has changed quite a bit. So it's pretty exciting, It's and so mm -hmm. I've... I've been in, in, involved for a few years, uh, although I'm not a politician. I'm just, you know, a commentator. So, um, but it's I've enjoyed it. Met a lot of people, and um, it, it's good. I've I've been to Europe and I've met some people with similar views and get their insights from, you know, being from former communist countries, and uh, I've I've really in, enjoyed it. Um, of course, in, in Europe, you always have to be more careful because you can only say certain things without being arrested, depending on the country. So in the United States, at least we don't have that fear. So that's one advantage. One thing that resonated with was the transition into, you know, the older stages of life and seeing the value of conservative modalities of thought you know, and ways of leave it, living. And I, I've, as a person who in his youth was Marxist and mm -hmm. having this radical shift into more conservative thinking, and as, as I progress, I, I kind of see the value in the theory of the conservative way of life. I, I find kind of, kind of strange that this new right is a youth movement. Yeah, I, I did a video recently about that, and, and in my opinion, is because the establishment now in the West is primarily left wing. Um, it's what it is. And years ago, when I was a kid, I was too young to be part of it, but I remembered, you know, like the Generation '68, the hippies and everything. They were, you know, they, they were left wing and they looked at the establishment as being right wing. Well, you got to remember now, if in 1968, if you were 20 years old, a young guy, you would be, I think, 67 now. So those people are like elderly. They're the ones really in charge of the institutions now. So it's kind of flipped. So you got these people now, the people that are going to be rebel against the system or be different. Most people just follow what's ever popular, what's ever fashionable. But if you do have people that are going to resist the system, they tend to be younger because uh, they're not as set in their ways. So I don't really think, because you've always heard, you know, people when they're young, they're left wing, and then they grow older, they become right wing. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think people more, if they're going to resist whatever the system is, they tend to be younger. And so if the system is right wing, uh, the resistance will come from young left-wing people. And now because of the establishment is more left-wing, the resistance is more from the, the right-wing. So, like, the, the people I meet on the alt-right, I mean, I'm pretty old, but most of the people I meet, they're really young. I just met a couple of uh, guys, uh, this guy and this girl, they were 19 years old um, here. And so, I mean, we have a really young group that's 
really uh, propelling this and gives the energy to what I call the alt-right movement, which is exciting, but I think it's kind of be expected because the youth has that passion to change things. Hmm. There's also a lot of reproductive capital in just being against the established authority. Yeah, how do you mean by that reproductive capital? Uh, to put it crudely, you know, you can get good pussy if you're a rebel. Oh, I guess you were saying, okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, you're right. It, it, it is interesting that it comes to the sexual dynamics is most of people, and this is nothing wrong with women, but most women, you know, they're, they're, that's why fashion mostly targets women, right? Because it's they want to be more part of the herd. But ironically, women, they tend to notice people that are outside of the herd, uh, either good or bad, but they notice them. And so, yeah, guys that are outside of the herd or the mainstream, that you're right, they do get a lot more attention um, from both girls, left wing and right wing. It's 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 kind of an interesting phenomenon. Even left wing girls tend to be re, you know, attracted to right wing guys. They may hate it intellectually, but you know they're not going to be attracted to the you know the little. Uh, guy standing next to him saying this is what a feminist looks like and apologizing that he's a man and crying about his cis privilege and you know all of that I mean a girl may think ah that's what I want a guy to be real sensitive always apologizing about being a man and having a penis but in real life in her like reptile brain is like oh gross you know let's <laughs> I like you but not in that way <laughs> they get at that the you know let's be friends thing so yeah it's um yeah, that that is a lot of truth to that. So, and um, so that's good. I mean, that, that it recruits people to the cause. But yeah, we have a lot of girls now or women that are interested in the movement too. Um, I'm one of the girls that follows me on Twitter. She's a, of all things a uh, porn star in France, <laughs> but she also does a lot of um, uh, street protests against the establishment. She's you know she's pro pro French. She's against Islam and she does all these uh, protests out there. So it's, it's almost kind of like she's the opposite of feminine. You know how feminine does topless protests against mm. I don't know Christians, but she does that uh, like on the uh, for the right. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a different group of people now that we're seeing, and it's, it's kind of fun, and it's really growing, at least here in the United States, and I, I think a little bit worldwide, which is really strange, because, you know, now because of the Internet and communications, and what we're doing now, right, we have these memes that we develop, I don't know where they develop, maybe in the United States, but then I go to Romania, and I hear them there, you know, people talking the, the same type of things, you know, and it's like, how do you know that, and it's because the world's connected now, and so... There's less of that gap, I think, around the world um, of what's happening. It's not as localized as it would have been, let's say, in the 1970s, right? So like an Irish kid now in Dublin uh, can get on the Internet and see what's happening in you know, Romania or the United States. So I, I think that's kind of changed things a little bit, too. I'd say it's a drastic change. I, I'd say that we haven't even fully comprehended the change. Which yeah, I. Yeah, it is exciting. It, it, there's some good and bad about it. The uh, the good is is because we can communicate so quickly. Uh, the bad is you know people are really changing. Uh, the cultures, the traditional cultures, are kind of going away. Yeah. And that's one of the things I noticed when I went to like Hungary or Romania. You know, I, I was from the United States. I I thought there'd be all these quaint little people there, but when you get there, the, the the kids just look like kids from the United States, right? They're just sitting around in a Starbucks, looking at their iPhones and texting. <laughs> you know, they're not <laughs> they're not doing what we want them to think in their their little their traditional outfits or whatever. You know, they're just regular people, and you're seeing that everywhere now. So. Um, it, yeah, it's definitely changed. But it's an it's exciting time for that, too, though. Mm -hmm. The good thing is, because of this, uh, uh, the communications now, I think it's harder for the state to really regulate the narrative, even though they may control a lot of the major communications. The Internet has really changed that, uh, where especially younger people get their information. So there's less of a monopoly, and things happen so fast now, right? If, like, the parachuting happens... Is immediately on Twitter and all mm -hmm. sorts of uh, before it's even on the major news feeds. Because, and the people they have cell phones everywhere with cameras and they can immediately upload what's happening. So it's you're having this explosion of information that's harder 
for states uh, to control in a monolithic manner like they would have, you know, under, let's say, in the communist times, even under Ceausescu or East Germany. You just can't control things anymore, which I think is a good thing because the information gets out there. I think they try, but it's very difficult to do so. I think uh, with the internet, the average citizen has been raised to the level of um, like a competing secret agent, you know. Uh, mind games now need to be played in a much more elaborate way. Uh, you know, I'm wondering, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm venturing into conspiracy theory land and, you know, maybe you might have a thought on that. Of, you know, new innovative ways of obscuring the narrative. Oh, yeah. And, and at first I, I have to say, I have to kind of preface this because <laughs> I'm, mostly everything that changes is on the extremes because the majority of people, I, I don't, I think they use internet, I don't know, for porn, right? <laughs> they don't really care about it. <laughs> so, I, you know, but the people that are interested in activism, you're right, there are people that definitely try to um, change the narrative uh, by doing shills and all that type of stuff. That's not conspiracy. People do that it, to try to discredit a group and so forth. And that's always a, the tough thing that we have on the alt right is because the alt right, we're just we're not the traditional Republicans, but at the same time, we're not the neo Nazi that types, right? And so the, our enemies who are against the alt right, the way they figure to try to discredit us is if they can have. Per, people pretend to be alt-right but then they act this neo-nazi type of way they know that will discredit us so sometimes they actually do pay, pay people uh argent provocateurs and all that sort of thing so um i don't know if that's really new i mean i, I assume even in your irish history and before the internet sometimes the government would do stuff like that wouldn't they pay people to try to discredit a group oh yeah um to give you a solid example after the troubles in Belfast, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Northern Ireland, right? It transpired that three of the four heads of the IRA, based in Dublin, were actually MI5 agents. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah, and and that's because the government. Sometimes they know if they can provoke something, then that gives them the pretext to get, you know, clamp down on legitimate dissent. So that's always the, the difficult thing. And so that's always been around. But I think now because of the Internet, you're seeing that, that now more active with people on the Internet that are not always who they seem to be. So they can try to change or to discredit the narrative. And it's the old guilt by association. It's a logical fallacy, but it, it, just because it's a logical fallacy doesn't mean it's not effective. And people mm -hmm. definitely try to use it because it helps their cause. So, um, you know, there's ways that people can try to get around that. I, I, I speak at a group called American Renaissance, and I would call them part of the alt-right with Jared Taylor, but um, he's always had to do measures to keep out the nuts and the you know shills to try to discredit the group so um yeah that that is a uh, the tricky thing and um and you're seeing a lot now too is people the you say on the internet how things change is they use a lot of humor that's kind of what i do and other things to make fun of the systems and that's very effective too when you can ridicule the opponent that's probably more effective than a long boring speech right because most people aren't going to listen to a long boring speech but if you make a funny video or something that is effective so we're seeing more of that too i think um because of the internet and because it's a low, there's not it's a low barrier of entry, you know. Because years ago, in let's say the 70s or 80s, to get on television, it was pretty difficult. But now everyone can kind of create their own content. All you need is a camera, load it up to YouTube, and uh, you can. That's what I did. You can build a pretty big audience to be no, known worldwide, and you can influence people. And so the gatekeepers really aren't there anymore, which I think kind of pisses them off because that's the control they used to have. Now anyone can get their view out there. And so it's made, made, has made things more dynamic in a good way, I think. Overall, in a good way. And when you mention comedy between yourself and Shiksa Goddess, mm -hmm. it opened my eyes way faster, like within instant. 
then articles and dry 15 minute soliloquies on YouTube. Oh yeah, um, it, it, that happened. The left did that. I always on the left in America, we had a guy called uh, Norman Lear in the '70s, and he was a television producer. But he's the one that really popularized a lot of the left-wing concepts and got them in our culture. And he did it by putting them into popular comedies, like we had Mash, All in the Family, and so forth. But the, he was able to get his narrative in those shows that wasn't, you know, like Trotsky doing some long, boring speech or Stalin or whatever. It's, you know, something that's entertaining that people will watch. And I think that's more effective because then people see stuff like that and they can kind of play along with it. And we're, we see that in the alt-right now is uh, people start to mock and make fun of concepts that used to be taboo. And once people start laughing at something, it's hard to you know gain control of the narrative over it anymore. So, um, yeah, like Shiska Goddess, she she was, does that with her videos. And uh, um, these guys on the uh, Right Stuff blog, I listened to them. They they put out a great video called Dildoween. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> it was pretty hilarious. So um, check that out. Yeah, dildo ween, kind of like Halloween, but dildo ween, and they they took it, they they changed their lyrics to one of those um, Disney uh, movies, and it was funny. Yeah, definitely check it out. But they have a lot of our memes and our sayings and everything. So um, yeah, it's it's gone really quick, and a lot of the young people they have these you know memes they do like Pepe the Frog and all sorts of weird things that a lot of people don't understand, but it really catches on and it's it's really kind of uh, worldwide that I've I've seen that now. Even in Britain, in there's some people that are doing work out of Britain that are using the terms I think that came out of America. So it's, it's kind of funny how that all ties together. As a little bit of a anecdote. And you know his historical refer reference. When Stalin took control of the Communist Party in Russia, he had no he had no reservations. He got rid of all of the writers and the playwrights, either killed them or deported them. But there was this one guy, and his name escapes me because you know, come on, Russian names. Mm -hmm. And he was a satirist. And Stalin couldn't do anything to him because it would just look ridiculous if he were to punish the guy in any way because he was just making jokes. He wasn't saying anything in particular that Stalin could point out. Right, yeah. And that's always been... And I've, I've, I've talked to some people in Eastern Europe that lived under communism a lot of them were young at the time but uh that's how they got around it it's, it's not like really people necessarily believed in it but they made a lot of jokes about it and um they had a lot of their humor to get around uh, the the situation and the mindset mindset and um because they had a, it was really based on a lot of uh on envy they, in Romania, they had a, a saying that neighbor's goat must die too. Uh, that's how it translates into English. But what they meant by that is if your goat should die, then th your neighbors, it's not fair that they should have a goat. And so the whole communism was really based on a system not of really building things, but of, of tearing other people down or other things down. And that was really the mindset, I guess the mindset of envy. And so... Um, yeah, that, that really created the, a lot of the issues in those societies, which we st still see today, but it was really embedded in how they thought. And strangely being echoed in a intellectual sense in the United States and other territories. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we definitely are going in that direction here in the United States, too. So... Uh, yeah, the United States, we're going through a lot of interesting times, just how we're changing so much, and uh, there's so much uh, conflict, really, in the States. So it's we're not a united country anymore, that's for sure. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, and which, you know, is a brilliant segue for me, because I'd like to backpedal a little. When we were discussing the the Internet homogenizing people, 
my mind was brought back to was it your 2011 uh, sorry 2014 or 2015 American Renaissance appearance mm -hmm. you made an illusion you didn't spend much time on it but you suggested that um, the way forward is not so much white identity but identitarian identity right yeah I, I look at nationalism as more than um racial and um I, I again being in europe taught me that a lot just because there's less of a concept in europe i don't know about ireland but at least in central europe about um uh being white as something that binds you together necessarily for example um a girl I knew in Romania. She, um, you know, she doesn't. She doesn't like Africans, or she doesn't. They definitely don't like gypsies, right? They cause a lot of problems. Roma, they call them there. Yep. But then, you know, I, you know, she's asking me. She goes, "Well, you know, how would you describe this white nationalism, you guys? What's their concept?" And I, and I said, "Well, you know, it's white people." And she goes, oh, "Like Germans?" She goes, "Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I like Germans." I said, "Like Swiss?" She goes, "Oh, good, good." And, and I said, "Yeah." And I like, um, well, like Russians. And she goes, oh, wait a minute, what did you say? And I said, Russians. She goes, no, I won't have anything to do with that. It's Russians. She goes, they're like, they're the goddamn white Jews. And it's like, <laughs> because that was her term for it, white Jews, Russians, because she saw their history of Russians in those countries is still a little touchy. You know, it's, they don't see them as their brothers necessarily because of the historical reasons. So... It's a little bit different. I, I think that's changing a little, little bit now again, but there's still a mm. lot of ethnic uh, differences, which is okay, and I think that's why we have nations. Um, mm. Well, I guess I don't have to tell you guys that, right? I mean, historically, you guys weren't always best of buds with the English, were you? Um, there's some tension there, I think. So um, mm. there was the same thing in uh, Eastern Europe with, like, Hungary versus – I had no idea until I uh, visited there quite a bit – Hungary versus um, – Romania. There's a lot of tension there because Transylvania used to be part of Hungary, at least a lot of it, and because of the wars and Stalin, they gave the territory back and forth. So there's still a lot of uh, tension between the various ethnic groups. So it's just not whiteness. Um, really what defines the people is more than race. It's also your religion and your language and your culture. And that's – I'm a nationalist, and that means I think it's good to preserve those by having separate countries – because I'm not, I don't know what's superior. I'm not a supremacist because I don't, I can't say one's better than the other. But they're good that people can have their identities in whatever their countries are. So uh, that tends to make things, I think, a little bit um, better. In fact, what's, that caused a lot of problems, I think, with your history, right? With the English and the Irish being uh, I, primarily it was religious, I believe, part of it, but you were a separate people too. And uh, I think that's what caused a lot of the issues is. The Irish didn't like to be under the English heel, so that created a uh, resentment. And I think you see that worldwide. It's just not England versus Ireland. It's Russia, you know, controlling Romania at the time or Hungary. That creates a lot of resentment. People want to have what we call self-determination. So, uh, yeah, it's bigger than um, race. I think the race aspect came more popular in the United States just because – we as Americans came from a lot of different types of Europeans. You know, there's a lot of the English were the initial, but then we got a lot of German Germans came here, and you know, from Norway, the Irish then of course came in quite a bit. So we're kind of a blend of different ethnicities from Europe that kind of over time just kind of mushed together, and so we don't as much anymore have the feeling of oh I'm Irish or I'm German some of that but it's mostly now you know we're american so that's like myself my hair my name is ramsey that's scottish i believe but you know i've never been to scotland so i'm an american so, so that's a little different well yeah uh whenever i hear from a white person in america it's always i'm half italian half irish you know it's never everything yeah. Everyone's Irish. That's like the biggest popular thing. <laughs> well, it's, Zach it's won't weird. like the sound of that. Uh, it's just something that everyone likes to do to be cool. I think it's because of St. Patrick Day, <clears throat> Day. You know, everyone likes to say they have a little Irish in them. So, and um, I, I do too. I actually I did my 23andMe genetic test, and it says I do have some Irish in me. So I don't know. But... Okay. So you're legit. 
Okay. I, I guess, yeah, a little legit. Some also some English and Scottish and German. So yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's I, that's why you're going back to what you said. Uh, nationalism is more than racial. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you're ever going to get all white people to you know agree and be together, or even that concept really. And not just white people. It's, we do the same thing with other groups too, like. Asians, we call them, but they're not. I used to be uh, real good friends with a Japanese girl, and you know she doesn't have any solidarity with Chinese. <laughs> they don't. They kind of don't like each other. So we tend to dump people together in these big groups like Africans, Asians, or you know Europeans. But it's there's a lot of uh, if I could use the word diversity between that. So uh, even here in the United States, you know, we're coming up on Thanksgiving. You hear a lot about the Indians or the Native Americans, but they were never monolithic. They fought each other. They had they had their separate tribes and their different customs. So uh, people are different. They have different ways they like to do things, and I think that's good. You know, I think Ireland belongs to the Irish, and I want you guys to hopefully always keep your your customs and your people. And that's the most important thing you have is your people, and so that's why you need to try to restrict immigration into Ireland. So. You keep that up, Great. and your language. I I don't know. Do you guys still speak Gaelic, or am I no. old old school? You know, it's dying. It's almost is dead. it. Yeah, yeah. That's too bad because that's, uh, language is a way to help protect a country. And Hungarian, I guess, is very difficult to learn. So that's one of the things that binds them together. And I imagine mm -hmm. Gaelic is a very difficult language. It's not difficult. It is the way that it has been taught to us. And I personally think that that was a part of the genocidal plan is to teach it to the native children in such a way that they get traumatized as opposed to learn anything. Right. Well, what we're seeing now that just really surprises me is, is how English has become such a dominant language wherever you go, and mm -hmm. um, especially with the young people. And again, in Hungary and Romania, if you're under 30 years old, you speak English because that's required there, and um, wow. so it's become, what? yeah, it's becoming kind of the international language. I guess the way years, a couple hundred years ago, French used to be, but yeah. before that, Latin. So, huh. So when you bring up the question of the concept of whiteness, and um, you asked about the Irish concept of whiteness. We have yeah. no concept of being white. And really? It, yeah. It, you know, a, an American and a French and a Danish is just as alien to us as an African. It, you mm. know, except, you know, up close, it's hard to get along with an African. You know, even um, one of the French Africans. But still, when we conceptualize it in our minds, a foreigner is a foreigner. We're all on our own in this little island up here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it'd be interesting, though, if you threw a bunch of Europeans together, white Europeans of different uh, countries, and let's say a bunch of Africans and a bunch of, let's say, Hispanics all together in a prison. I think you'd see all the white people would congregate together and the blacks together and so forth. So I, I think that does happen at mm. a macro level, but I think in a mi we see it all, all the time here anyway, but on a, because on the micro level, I think you're right. There's some of the, the, the differences. Um, I mean, we have that in the United States, too, between white people. Obviously, we had a, a it's not so much anymore, but there was always a difference between the, those damn Yankees, <laughs> the Northerners, and I'm, I'm from the South, so from us rednecks, so, you know, it's, there's always a difference between us and our or the way we think, but um, so, yeah, I think how it goes, you know, you, you kind of have your I, – I think your – I look at nationalism as kind of like if you throw a rock in a pond, you know, and it does a concentric circles, right? It's The first is your yourself, then you have your family, and then outside your family of your neighbors, and then your nation. In fact, that nation comes from the word uh, – it's like neonatal, right? It comes from the word birth. So it's mm. people that you're related to by blood. It's not a um, – you know, if I moved to Japan, I could become a Japanese citizen, but I, I would never be Japanese, right? They would understand, no, you're a, some white guy from America. And the, so the, the nation is just not about citizenship, it's about blood. And so I think that does make a difference. 
And then, you know, as you go further out, you know, you have more of the concept of European and who knows, maybe a human rural citizen. But there's always those differences on the on the lower level. And those differences are good, you know. I I like to think of the Irish as, I, I think they're a, uh, a pretty people the way I always imagine them, especially the girls, you know, fair skin, redhead. That's a stereotype, but I like that look. I maintain that. Well, it's it's what my genetics personally prefers to mate with, anyway. So you're not yeah. far wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's uh, and uh, my uh, my son, he's very redhead, so that must come from my Irish side. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, throwback. Yeah, yeah, definitely some of the genes there. Now, if I can stop you there for a minute. Now you mentioned that you're from the south. And that gives me an opportunity to ask a question for my producer. When it comes to secession, southern mm -hmm. secession, do you think that's a possibility? Uh, no, not like it was. I mean, just because things have changed so much now. And part of the big problem now is because there's so many... Um, if you look at the demographics, the south is heavily uh, black or African-American, we'd call it here. And so we're really seeing different – we have three primary groups in the United States now. Uh, the United States, first of all, was always 90 percent white from the beginning. And the blacks were less than 10 percent, and, you know, they are brought over as slaves initially. And now we're, we're seeing there's three groups. You have the African Americans who are primarily in the south, although they've moved around. Then you have – and our southwest is primarily Hispanic. There's part of – California and Texas and New Mexico is really, I mean, maybe technically part of the United States, but it's really Mexico. And then um, then we have the, the white people. So those are the kind of the three groups. So getting back to the South, I don't see the South separating uh, from the North anymore, but I do see eventually very possible that the United States could break apart one day, a la how the Soviet Union did, hopefully peacefully. Uh, just mm -hmm. because once you don't if you don't have anything that unifies you together, it's hard to maintain, unless you have a real strong police state, it's hard to maintain it. And if you have people that don't have shared values, which we're losing, I think we're going to see the desire for people to have self-determination and to break apart from Washington. So, yeah, I think the, the first civil war we have, although I, I would always argue that was our second civil war. Our first civil war was with the English, right? Because we were English at the time, and we uh, rebelled against them, and we formed our own nation. So that was number one. And number two was the, the South tried to I, – I think the South, maybe I'm biased, had a compelling argument. They said, hey, we joined the Union, and we want to quit now. I mean, we're, we're not trying to overthrow you or anything like that. We just want to be our own country now. And Lincoln said, no, you can't do that. So that's what started that war. So I'm sympathetic towards the South. I think they had a better argument. So there may be a one in the future where people try to break apart. Hmm. Back when they were trying to get rid of the Confederate flag, mm -hmm. um, I, I saw a video of a very proud-looking African-American who... She went out every day and flew the Confederate flag, and she was proud to be a Southerner. Mm -hmm. And I was always aware that, well, you know, uh, according to all reports I've gotten since I've never been to the United States or the South even, I've always been told that African Americans and white Americans lived together. They worked together. They they were family, they were friends. As opposed to the North, when the African Americans migrated up North and they were herded into ghettos. Is there any truth to that, or am I just hearing propaganda? Um, well, I think the South had more of a realistic view because they dealt with, and I'll just use a the term they used back then, Negroes, than the North did because the North didn't have any Negroes. So the South had a better understanding of really what they're about and how they're different and their different temperament. And so they did the South under, like, even after the Civil War, they had segregation. You had white-only areas and you had black areas. Uh, we call it Jim Crow at the time, meaning they would have restrooms just for whites and uh, restrooms, what was called coloreds, then is what the term was. Separate so there was, equal. 
Yeah, well, yeah, it wasn't equal because people aren't equal. There is no equality. But, yeah, that was the idea. And the, the idea was for the whites to try to protect themselves from the blacks, to be honest, is why they had that. So they got rid of that, though, in the 50s and 60s. But there's still de facto segregation, um, and that's, you know, like what Obama's trying to attack because the cities became – we had a busing uh, – the Supreme Court ruled to integrate schools and school districts. So in most major cities, that meant busing white kids to black schools and black kids to white schools. So whites, there's a concept called white flight. They moved, the parents would move out of the city so they wouldn't be subjugated to that. And so at the end, it became kind of silly. It was just all the cities were like Detroit became almost 100% black. So it's kind of silly to bus blacks around because the schools were already 100% diverse and no whites left, they left. So that's kind of what happened there. So I do think the South, though, had a little bit uh, better in in some ways racial relationship because there was a more better understanding of of the nature of it. And in the um, North, because they were a little bit, um, they weren't as around the the Negroes at the time, it was more of a, I guess they had a more of a naive look or there's more of a shock of the differences between the races. So there was that differences, but uh, there wasn't necessarily the animosity in the South between the black and whites. They're just different folk, as, as mm. so to speak. So, um, yeah, and actually, you know, if you notice all the race riots that happened in the United States in the 60s were in the North, not in the South. And, mm. um, so actually, I would say racial relationships have always been worse in the North than the South, because in the South, there's just been a greater understanding, I think, between the, the two groups, just my opinion. And so. Well, from from what all of all of that I've seen, it's much more natural and compassionate in the South. Um, have you ever heard of Louis Theroux? Mm-mm. Uh, he he's a good documentary uh, presenter, um, even though you know, of course, he leans to the left. Everyone mm-hmm. with a big name leans to the left, but he's very good at his documentaries. And uh, he made one on racists in the South, and he followed this one around this leader of some kind of KKK <laughs> offshoot. Mm-hmm. Followed him around in his daily life. And he went to see this Hispanic man, this uh, leader of the racist group. And, you know, to get his TV repaired. And he was relating to this man like, oh, you know, how are you doing? How's such and such? Blah, blah, blah. You know, a real familial bond between Mm -hmm. this Hispanic man and this racist white man. And Louis Threw was trying to say hang on you're a racist what's going on here you that's your friend and, and you know the 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 racist such so called was saying oh no 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 he's not my friend he just fixes my tv you know we have this relationship but no he's your friend he's your friend you're you're talking to him like a friend so if a racist in the south relates to a Hispanic man as an equal that says a lot to me as an Irishman anyway looking from the inside or from, yeah. from the outside and I, I just have to tell you because things have changed so much the, the version that uh, I'm sure Europe has of the South is really um, not like it was 50 years ago it's probably yeah. like us thinking of Ireland 50 years ago a lot of things have changed so yep. you know the, the South is like every place now is connected to the internet people have the same ideas so it's not so much anymore uh the way it used to be it's just more like everywhere else so um and and a lot of there's still a lot of old kind of stereotypes like the kkk doesn't really exist really and so all those things are from a kind of a bygone era so things have changed quite a bit but you're you're right it's um there's just because you or care about your people doesn't mean that you have to hate other people and I I think that's kind of what nationalism is about meaning I could think that Ireland Ireland should be for the Irish but that doesn't mean I hate Japanese right because I Mm -hmm. I also support Japan being for the Japanese in fact I really I like Japanese I think they're really I mean I think the girls are cute yeah we heard about that Paul 
Yeah, my yellow fever, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and they are. They're cute girls, and they, they have a, they have a good culture, and I, I, I just like everything Japanese. But I'm not Japanese. I'll never be Japanese. So, um, you know, that'd be like, am I a Japanese supremacist? Not really, you know, because I want Japan to stay with the uh, Japanese. And that's the way I look for all countries. I, I wish Germany would stay for the Germans. I hate to see them being basically genocide. The, you know, France should be for the French and all that. I think nations make things happier. I'm kind of against the globalist agenda. Now, that doesn't mean I don't think people should be able to visit other countries or interact peacefully. And that of all people, I'm like really anti-war. I'm, I'm really ashamed of a lot of the United States policies over the years of trying to impose democracy, all this nonsense in Iraq and Syria and God knows what else we're involved with. Um, I'm opposed to that, and I wish we wouldn't do that. I wish we would live more peacefully with our neighbors. So I'm really kind of a, I'm on the right, but I'm anti-war because it's kind of funny because always the tradition is right-wingers or warmongers and all that, but that's just, I think, propaganda. I'm, I'm against most wars, so I like to see people live peacefully with each other and treat each other with respect, so no matter your race. So that's kind of the, my view on the situation. And whether you're a Christian or an atheist or a pagan, you know, you have a, a natural wisdom, a spiritual wisdom that says, treat others as you would like them to treat you. If there wasn't all of these wars, then we wouldn't have this deluge of Islamification. Yeah, I mean, that. if you think about it, that really started this, our whole nonsense in Iraq, which I was opposed because, you know, Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks, but Americans are kind of stupid, to be honest. <laughs> and so it was like, you know, the, our towers got, you know, it was horrific, right? No no doubt about it. But we're like, God damn it, we need to kick someone's ass now. And so we already had a... Um, we were pissed off at Iran anyway, or at least our leaders were, so that was an excuse. So a lot of the Americans, they're not that smart. They're like somehow figured that somehow Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein are somehow related, and Saddam Hussein has these mass weapons. He's about to nuke us or something, and so we better attack him now. The propaganda was silly, but that's what happened. And so then when he got out of power, right, that's what started all this chaos, right? Because we, we, we're good at destroying things as America, but then we're like, you know, uh, sorry guys, you know, figure it out on your own now. And so then that's where you have these, now these Shunis and the Shiites and they all hate each other and the Kurds. And I think this ISIS now really came out of the Sunni element that was against our Shiite government that was puppet government that was imposed. And so that's really was started a lot of this issue is us trying to overthrow these dictators. And I'm not saying these dictators were good people. I'm just saying it's none of our business, right? Like Assad, I'm not saying he's a great guy. I don't know, but he's he doesn't mess with us, so I don't see any reason to try to overthrow him. And because we try to overthrow him, we end up giving our weapons to these moderate terrorists or whatever we call them. And then we're like, oh, wow, how did we know? They sold their weapons to ISIS. We couldn't figure that one out. So, you know, our foreign policy is a stupid mess, and so it's embarrassing, but that, that's, that's that's the disadvantage to be from America. Because at, at least Ireland, you guys don't mess with anything. I don't think you guys meddle, do you? Or were you part of NATO? Do you get involved with, like, Afghanistan and all that, or you guys just kind of keep it your own? We had an airport that the bombing planes stopped at to refuel on their way to Afghanistan and Iraq. And we tried and tried. I, I, every day of my life was dedicated to shutting that thing down. And the parochial bullshit opinion was, oh, don't insult the Americans. They'll take away all the jobs they gave us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... Yeah, it's that's kind of how we are. We're, it, some of the stuff I don't even understand. That's why I support Trump. He's like... Why do we still have troops in Germany? And, you know, I'm like, you know, that's a good question. I mean, I think the Nazis have been defeated, is it 70 years ago now? I, I don't know. I don't, who who are we protecting Germany from? It's like, do we still have troops in Ireland? I don't know. We have troops everywhere, it seems like. It's just like, and I don't know why we need to have these troops everywhere. So that's, that's a good thing about Ireland. I don't think you guys have ever attacked a country, have you? I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that ever happening. 
Uh, well, you know, there was that time like four thousand years ago, but you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the last couple thousand years, I can't even imagine. I mean, you, you attack your own, and you know, like kneecap people and all that sort of stuff, but um, mm. the IRA and all that—that that was kind of a, um, I guess, a dicey time. But that was, that was about it. Yeah. So. Um, mm. Yeah, so the, I I just wish we could mind our own business, but it's kind of hard for us to mind our own business because of uh, people that have money that buy our politicians tend to uh, influence them. Can, can I say the name? Sure. Jews. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are. Uh, we have a lot of uh, donors that are very uh, Jewish that uh, um, donate a lot of money, and they want some return on the money, and they okay. set out their plan. They want, you know, Iraq to be overthrown and Assad and Iran. So sad. I and mean, most Americans, I don't think, really care because we just want to live our lives in peace. But um, yeah, so we're all, that's the thing I don't like about our Republicans. For the most part, they they just really like to agitate for war. So um, it's a it's a strange thing they do. Really, Americans, at least our politicians, are very bloodthirsty that way. I think they they feel that somehow it gets some popularity or whatever. I don't I don't know why. Like you guys don't have anything like that, do you? I mean, I couldn't imagine just like Irish Irish politicians saying, you know, we we need to take an army and invade Italy or something. You know, it's just I just can't imagine that happening. <laughs> we need to kick someone's ass. You know, I just don't see that happening. But you know, America, we're just always we're big on trying to kick someone's ass because we can't. By God, we're the most powerful nation in the world, and we'll blow you up if you don't like it. So that's kind of the way we are. So it's I I don't really like that part about of us. So what do, what do the Irish think about Americans? Are you guys like are pro-American or anti or just neutral or how does what's the typical man on the street feel about America? It's it's not it's not that we hate you guys. We just don't like you. And we don't <laughs> like what you do around the world. We don't like that you support yeah. Israel and. I was asked plenty of times since, you know, a part, a part of the whole alt-right discourse is repatriation of white people to Europe. I'm always asked, do Irish Americans have the right to come back to Ireland? And I say, hell no. Those people are nothing like us. Mm-hmm. So there's, you know, we, we, we don't have much respect. We have admiration for a lot of things that were achieved there. But the current state of Americans and the foreign policy just really puts us off. Yeah, well, I don't blame you about that, too. It puts me off, too. So, And that's the thing. A lot of the I, – I, I tweeted once, I don't think America – has American interests at heart, and yeah, that's what really sucks. So it's not like we're getting any benefit out of it. But um, yeah, we got this weird sort of um, the media pushes patriotism and with the military and the flag. That I, I don't think you guys have anything similar to that, do you? I mean, it's just that it really is no. kind of runs deep here. It's like we just really the idea of blowing things up. It just push a little tear in our eye and makes us really happy to be an American because we're free, God damn it. And we need to liberate people. So that, that's kind of how we look at the world. <laughs> you know, Americans are, and I hate to travel. I try not to be, you know, I'm, you know, I'm proud of my people. I'm an American. I, I'm not trying to, I, I love my nation, but sometimes it is embarrassing to go to Europe and because sometimes Americans are just so American, you know, they're so loud and everything. And so, so, you can always spot Americans. Can you in Ireland? Can you spot American tourists? I bet you can. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, th- there's even the standard American couple look. You know, the big fat mm-hmm. husband mm-hmm. with the camera around his neck. Yeah, and then the kind of floral dressed wife. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I even I even heard secondhand a story of. In the local airport, one of these cookie cutter couples, they, they were just kind of standing around trying to get their bearings of, you know, this tiny little airport. And along walks a little, you know, a person 
who suffers from dwarfism, you know? Mm -hmm. He walks past and uh, and the husband says, Look, honey, there's one. Oh, (laughs) jeez. There's one? What what was he thinking? He thought it was like an Irish elf. Leprechaun. Leprechaun, yeah. (laughs) Jeez. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's sad. But you know what? I have to be fair to defend my country. There's some other countries that are getting pretty fat. I've seen I've seen some Brits that aren't too skinny when I've been traveling. Uh-huh. So that obesity that obesity thing is I don't know if it's hit Ireland, but it's definitely hit Britain. And I was it's all there. They they try to push the obes- obesity scare, and there's certainly an overrepresentation of fat people, but we haven't gotten to the state that the United Kingdom is at, thank God. Yeah, they're pretty, I saw them, they're pretty heavy too. So yeah, it's that's another thing I noticed going into Eastern Europe is, um, well, I'm sexist, I admit it, because I'm straight. I look at girls, first of all, and they're so pretty over in Eastern Europe because they're thin, you know, and that's the big thing that's different than from America. I mean, there's a lot of pretty girls here in America too, but in general, people are just so fat here in America that it's just normal. And, um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, I think a fat person in in like Eastern Europe would be called kind of skinny here. <laughs> Anorexic. What's wrong with them? So yeah, there's yeah. Sometimes people get so fat here they can't even walk anymore. They have to go through Walmart and those little those scooters. I think when you got so fat you can't even walk anymore, that should be a sign to step away from the fork. But <laughs> oh, but the big thing down here in America too. I don't know if you heard, if it's here in Ireland or anything, but these people you know, trying to um, get rid of fat shaming. Meaning if you criticize people, they're oh, this is horrible. We need to accept fatness, and it's a social construct and all this sort of stuff. So. <laughs> fat people rights <laughs> so that's actually happening here so it is and yeah. the whole world is aware of it you know thanks to the internet your yeah. dirty laundry is hanging up all over the place it is I know so it's um, so, yeah I don't know why this is, you know the, the obesity here I think it must be in our food so now is, do you, is it is it, our stereotype of Ireland, I'll ask you a question, is that you guys are all drunks. And now, is that true? Do you guys all drink all the time? That's always a stereotype. Well, I'm drinking now. <laughs> okay, good. So you pulled it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I personally like that stereotype. That's how I blame I like to drink, too. I'm like, well, it's the Irish part of me, you know? So that, that's always the, the – people mostly like the Irish, but that is your stereotype you have of your country, a bunch of drunk drunk drunkards <laughs> so it, it's an unfair stereotype but we do drink a lot that is true mm-hmm. yeah probably actually probably like in Russia that's actually probably be more an issue they have a lot of alcoholism yeah. there than, than prior Ireland but, well yeah. I, I hear that uh, in on the you know when the big global depression hit uh, some Russians took to drinking perfume really wow yeah. yeah that's that's pretty bad so i don't i don't drink perfume i do like guinness so that is i like your beer so that's good beer mm. it's hard to find a good pint overseas but it's good stuff yeah i like the darker so um yeah i do like beer a lot paul can i ask you yes. a question right. yes go ahead we're loving your presence here. Can we take a four-minute break and hold you on for a little more afterwards? Sure. Is that a possibility? Okay. Of course. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to play more Shiksa Goddess because I love that woman. And she, <laughs> she's sounds, due to come on right. next week. Oh, really? Yeah. She, she got in a fight with me, though, you know, so. Yeah. You, you kind of ruined things for her, Paul. Yeah, the because I flat Earth thing. Yeah, I'm 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 kind of a wild guy. I believe the Earth is a sphere. So. Oh, you fucking heretic! <laughs> yeah, I know. I believe in all these Jew conspiracies. <laughs> 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 no, she's a sweet girl. I love her music. Her voice is really nice. And that's what matters. She's doing a good job. Let's take her at that. I 
I, I, I like everyone, man. I'm just I'm just an easygoing fellow. So I, I even like the Irish. So. Yeah, I, I noticed. I noticed. <laughs> uh, like even my wife said, "God, he's a really nice guy for a racist." <laughs> I, I I thought she was going to say for an American or something. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that's good, yes. So we're going to take a three-minute break, okay? Is that is that long enough for you? Should I uh, extend the musical break? Oh, no, it was four minutes, but three minutes is fine. I took away a minute, so go ahead. <laughs> All right, see you on the flip side. All right. Numbers cabalistic, many false statistics We want you afraid with the good media's cover Our power would be over Study your DNA to know what scares you To gain control of the world We took control of information All we publish is lies And nobody knows it's the key to our mind You just can type Ramsey Paul on Google, and you'll see all, all sorts of bad things about me. So <laughs> I'm easy to find. Yeah, I'm on YouTube, and I'm on Twitter, and I have my blog. So, yeah. Speaking of bad things to find on YouTube, yes. my producer wanted to hear your thoughts on you being on the SPLC map. Oh, yeah, that, that was pretty cool. I kind of like that. That helps out a lot kind of impresses, you know, impresses the chicks, right? You can say, hey, I'm the most third dangerous man in America. <laughs> what? 
<laughs> yes. No, that's what someone said. But I, I'm not. I'm a really nice person. So, no, it's uh, you got to understand RSPLC, Southern Poverty Law Center. They're not Southern, and they're not poverty, and they're not really. They don't really care. They're a Jewish organization that's left wing Marxist, and so they mostly try to uh, try to get people in trouble that have dissenting point of view. So. Um, but so they're not taking that seriously. But yeah, they're a uh, well-funded group, though. So they try to intimidate people from uh, dissenting from the narrative. So um, they can't. They tried that with me, but it didn't work because I don't care. So that's <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that it, 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 everyone's scared of being docs. But if you're open with who you are, it doesn't work. And they're like, I'm going to tell everyone who you are. I'm like, I don't care. And it's like, oh. <laughs> then I kind of like, oh, you know, then what? <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> so yeah, so whatever. Yeah, they the, they did a the whole truth. Thing. The truth is, if you're going to look up somebody online, if you go to somebody who is shit talking this person, instead of going to the person themselves and seeing what they have to say. You're you're not much of a human being to begin with, so nothing lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't really care. I mean, so I just um, I just do my my thing because I'm not really part of any political group or anything. I'm just a guy with a camera that did videos. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I'm an American just talking. So um, that's what America was supposed to be about: freedom of speech and ideas. So yeah, people don't have to agree with me. I don't care. So. I don't worry about what other people say. I don't know why they should worry about what I say, but, but some people do. It's kind of that nanny state. That some people always have to try to worry about what other people are thinking, so I don't care. Good to hear. We need more of that spirit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Mind your own business. <laughs> That's, that should be the philosophy of more people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just can't imagine having enough time to worry about others. I, you know, what they think, what they're doing. I'm like, I don't care, or whatever. <laughs> it's your life becomes so much lighter when you stop worrying about other people, and you, you know, you worry about what's going on for yourself. Um, this is, you know, and I would like your opinion on this. Uh, before you came on, I was giving my rap about the terrorist attack in Paris. Personally, I think, you know, that there's, an, that there's an Israeli false flag element in there, for me, anyway, personally. And I think that the, the narrative has been just saturated with anything related to the terrorist attack. And I think this just detracts from the important things that we should be focused on like safeguarding our own countries, our own communities, learning about the way our ancestors have lived this will take up weeks and weeks of our time just you know arguing about yeah, anything involved with this terrorist attack in Paris it's a waste of time. And, and, and what's your opinion on that, Paul, if you could run with well, that? Yeah, I mean, it's sad. Everyone uses it for their own agenda, of course. And it's um, it, a lot of people like to status signal, we call it, meaning, oh, there's a horrible attack, so I'm going to change my Facebook profile to show the French flag. And it's not like they really give a damn, really. It's just to show their friends that they're just superior people that care and all that type of stuff. Um, you know, it was just it, people are like whatever the, the the newest fad is, like the gay marriage. They put up the gay marriage flag to show that they're status signaling how moral they are. So you have these tra tragedies or you know murders, and then people just jump on it to try to feel good about themselves. But I don't think it will really change much unless you really change the policy. So uh, yeah, I, I think you're right on that end. It, it's um, it's just a way to people to get, kind of push their point of view or try to get attention or whatever. So I don't know if we'll see many 
policy changes because I think France is still committed to being overrun by the third world, at least the politicians. And um, so it's, uh, you know, I don't really know what's going to change on that aspect of it. And, you know, we're going to continue to see more attacks in the future, right? And so, you know, I don't think there's anything they can do about it. Well, there's things they can do about it, but they won't do it. So they will come. Sorry, I've just been distracted by the image that the SPLC has used to frame you with. And you look like something out of Star Wars. I, I oh, was that the? Was that? Yeah, I should have. You know, I should have sued him for that image actually. Because what they did is uh, that was I in that hoodie with a gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll yes. post the they exact that, uh, I, crop of it. Yeah, yeah. See, what that was was um, I was doing a video and I was mocking, I think Trayvon Martin or whatever. So I was pretending to be that. So that would be like that's really defamation. Technically, I talked to a lawyer about it. That mm. would be like if you took a actor that was playing the part of a Nazi on TV and then took that image and said that person is in real life a Nazi. I mean, that's defaming them. They're not. Mm -hmm. They're playing a role, right? That wasn't even a real gun. That's a toy gun I've had since I was a kid. So I was playing a role of being like the gangster, but they used that image of me to try to portray me like I'm this <laughs> hoodie gangbanger or something. It's kind of funny, <laughs> but I'm not that. I was, I was playing a role there. They, so that was they, I was doing like a skit and they, just, they stole an image of my skit and decided to portray me like that. <laughs> Bastards. Fuck them. But that's what they did. So dark. Yeah. You, you, have know, you I seen kind of... the Star Wars movies? Because you know you. you it's yeah, the I, Sith. I Sith. That's it. Yeah, I'm a, the Sith. I'm a Sith. I'm a Sith Lord. I like in a way that's kind of cool. But you know, because it doesn't mm. make me look. Because you know, I, I I'm not, I'm really a nice guy. I'm not. A, I'm really low key and everything. So I, I guess it helps me look edgier if they make me like that. <laughs> but I usually don't wear a hoodie unless it's cold out. But I don't. <laughs> I don't carry my toy gun around. So, folks, if you're listening live on evrn.net slash live, scroll past the uh, chat box, and on the left you'll see a blue refresh, refresh button. Hit that, you'll see a link to Ramsey Paul's YouTube link, as well as the cute little image of his as the Sith Lord. It is. I'm holding a gun there. It looks menacing. There's like a swastika right beside my head, too. Yeah, that's pretty scary looking. <laughs> that was me right before I attacked a synagogue. So, yeah, that's what it looks like. So I've got this question from my assistant producer, and um, I have to admit I don't really understand it. That's okay, I'll answer it anyway. Okay. Uh, Hungary has, from the outright, taken a hardline stance against the immigration of refugees generated by the crisis. France has now closed its borders, though hardly a hard line response. Do you think more restricted border control will become more common over the next few years? Or is it even possible that free travel between European member states will be will come to an end? Um, well, I think, yeah, I think there will be more restrictions with countries like Hungary and Poland. I don't know about France or Germany. I mean, if they're, they may have gone too far. So I don't know if there's any hope from them being saved as countries. Um, I mean, because, you know, the Islam, the Muslims are brag that they one day will make those Islamic states. Maybe they will. So um, for what France and the German people have to do, I don't know if they have the will to do it. So I, they, they probably will die. <laughs> so I'm not very <laughs> optimistic about that, right? Unless they're real willing to go Vlad the Impaler on him. That's the only other option, so I don't see that happening. Let, let, let's, let's get real here. Um, now, that, now that you've broached that, we're on what, what, what I call the B-side. 
People can listen live, but for this segment, they have to make a donation of five euro, at least for a month, but on a continual basis to listen to the podcast later on. The whole interview with you, Ramsey, by the way, will be on YouTube. Oh, excellent. Okay. Now that we're sequestered away from Mm -hmm. the majority of, you know, the riffraff, Mm -hmm. the idea of going Vlad the Impaler on these people, are you you serious about that? Because you made a a, uh, metaphor in one of your videos about just, you know, bombing a boatload of um, Indians in in a uh, story context of course you wouldn't bomb a boatload of Indians but should we go that far well uh, it, it, did you ever read Camp of the Saints by the way <laughs> no. I would really highly recommend it yeah it was a book and it was a French author in the 70s he kind of described what he kind of predicted what happened at the time there was from India he just had all these huge millions of people got on boats and was headed to Europe and uh, Europe didn't know what to do about it because do you, what do you do? Do you bomb those ships or how do you stop it? And they didn't have, eventually they didn't have the will to do that. So they all came in and destroyed Europe. Uh, that's the purpose of the armies to defend your borders, right? And so it doesn't mm-hmm. matter if the people coming have guns or not. If they won't stop, you shoot them. So yeah, I mean, if, if they won't stop, they should be forcefully removed back. But, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's, there's not any, uh, our sense of morality doesn't really transcend other people necessarily and unfortunately the people who are willing to fight for what they believe in usually will win and that's one thing I do give the Muslims that they do have the willingness to die for their cause whereas I don't know if most Europeans would die uh, die for their people at all uh, so in fact they probably would just lay down and die so you, you got to have that willingness to be able to uh, fight for your people and I don't know if the people in Western Europe, spiritually, still have that in them anymore because they seem so spiritually defeated. And um, maybe some don't. I don't know. That's the sense I get that they would rather die than to put up any sort of resistance. Am I wrong, or would people fight? It's hard to tell because all we have is the dominant narrative, right? Right. All we have is what they put in front of us. We we really don't know what the common person thinks. Yeah, I mean, and it's not genetic, right? Because I like to study European history, and for God's sakes, <laughs> you guys dealt with each other. You know, Henry VIII put heads on. I mean, it wasn't the Muslims that just decapitated people. You guys did a lot of that too, right? So there was a lot of ultra violence, I guess, that happened back then with uh, Europeans. So I I don't know, you know, it's just I don't know if it's been bred out or it's just it, it could be switched around. But um, you know, now there's no desire to fight for the people. Instead, it's maybe do a candlelight visual and sing John Lennon's Imagine, maybe cry and hug someone and hope that changes things. And um, eventually everything comes out of force. I'm, I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying that's how the world works, is that you can have all these nice thoughts, but it always comes down to, you know, who has the bigger gun usually wins. And that's how things are decided. So, um, And if you don't have the will to defend yourself, the people that do have the will, uh, they won't really care about your altruistic point of view. They'll be happy to slice your throat and be on with it. So that's how it comes down is people are willing to defend themselves or not. And I'm not sure if Western Europe or much of the West is willing to defend itself. I think part of the East is still, but I don't know. We'll have to see. Like yourself, I'm a student of history, and it really shocks me how something that could be the norm for millennia is suddenly taboo. Like, to give an example... And, you know, I I repeat this all throughout my show. Regular listeners will recognize this historical example. We had a lot of problems with Normans in Ireland. And I'm part Norman because they eventually integrated into our culture. But major cities like our capital, Dublin, 
was originally founded by Normans who were Vikings that settled in France and then invaded from France to Ireland. At one point we had a saturation of Normans. They built castles and they sequestered the better part of our land and kind of built fortresses and amassed riches. So uh, over the course of about seven or ten days we slaughtered 50,000 of them. And that was the end of it. And this was normal. This was everyday activity. Right. If somebody came to your country and they weren't like you, then you kill them. Right. I mean, it was a norm and um, Norman. Yeah, we need uh, reparations for 1066. I don't know if you guys ever got them, but yeah. Um, that is, and I think in the case of this in general too. I remember, you know, the 12th, 11th centuries in France and during that time there was a lot of it was a rough times all the the different people and i think death was just so much more common <laughs> with people i mean everyone dies now too but i think people saw it more as in your everyday life and you know, we've become very uh, isolated from it for, to a large degree and i think at the time you you had to be pretty tough in order just to live because Forget about invaders, right? Just your neighbors would probably take advantage of you, run you through, take your purse, and you know, no one would really care. I mean, it was they had to be you had to be tough back then to defend your family and your stuff. And um, uh, I know the Irish were tough back then, even just fighting. So it was, I think, the way you had it. And I think we've become as the West. So, and I'm not saying it's bad. It's been good in a way. We've been a lot peaceful, but we've got people so far away from having to really defend themselves and to really see blood and death. It's all abstract to us, maybe a video game, but we don't see it in real life, yeah. that it's caused some, I think, weakness within us to do what sometimes needs to be done. And uh, whereas you don't see that so much within... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, the Syrians, for example, they all around bloodshed and fighting, and is is part of their nature. So they're they're not as squeamish about doing what they feel is the right thing to do. And um, I, you know, so I I think it's cultural. I don't think obviously genetics don't change that much because I don't think we've genetically changed that much in just a few hundred years. It's just uh, kind of the narrative and how we lived. And I, I think that would change real quick if people had to live in a rougher time then they would become rougher themselves so I think we've been able because we've been so sheltered we've been able to do a lot of weakness and nonsense and get away with it you know we could sit around and play John Lennon and imagine it makes us feel good um, but one day that's not going to work and we either have to fight or we'll die because that's just how nature is it's not you know, take the morality out of it. That's just how the world works. That's, that's how the animal kingdom works, right? What makes us think that we're the exception? Really? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I, we're not, and uh, I think we've become very decadent as a people. And I'm not throwing rocks. I, I'm that way too, right? So it's yeah. I don't know if I could survive like my ancestors did. And it's. Is rough. I mean, they had to they had to deal with things we don't have to deal with, and every day. So uh, that made a sense of toughness about them that was more realistic. And I think we can do silly things like change our Facebook icons and think that will make a difference, <laughs> you know. But, but they didn't have that illusion. They had to deal with it right then and there. Uh, you know, if someone's trying to you know steal your property in your home. I'm not even talking invaders and rape your wife. You either deal with the situation or you die. That's what it comes down to. You can't do sing a nice little song about humanity. I mean, they'll just laugh at you, slit your throat, and you know, rape your wife and take your money. And so that's that's how the that's how it is. That's real world. And I think the West has become very insulated and very kind of they haven't been seeing what really needs to be done. Will that change? I don't know. It may as things start to break down, people realize they have to respond more forcefully. This might sound tangential, but it's a good segue 
when you mention death. It brings me to your bookshelf. Mm -hmm. you, you've often had a skull on your bookshelf, which, you know, brings the mind back to our mortality. And my assistant producer has noticed, because he's an avid watcher of your videos, he's noticed mm -hmm. that there's always, depending on what you were talking about, there was a variety of books behind you. And he wanted to know, are you an avid reader? And, you know, what's your favorite area? Yeah, I do read a lot, and I, I also have some games behind me I, I kind of do, too. I used to love to play strategy <laughs> games. I still do when I can. I, I, I love uh, history, as I think we talked about, and um, I was just uh, reading a, um, a book about 12th century France, in fact. I think it was um, – I forget the name of it right now. <laughs> it slips my mind, but it talked about the plague and just how – I, we can't even. I mean, it was almost like a Mad Max situation back there with the plague and how one out of every three people, sometimes whole villages, would die. I mean, it was just. And then you had these uh, thieves and robbers that would go around the, the land. It was like a, it, it's something we can't even imagine today. This was France, right? And the, in a way, those people, even though we're related to them genetically, they, they lived in such a different time that uh, they wouldn't even understand us today I don't think I really don't it's such you know they had a their life was so difficult for those people so yeah I like to read because it, it gives you a better perspective that you know we tend to get a lot of prejudices based on when we live and if you don't only know when we live and you don't know history past 1980 or 70 it, it can you can see things that you know we take as granted may not always be true and what we think is an altruistic truth may not really be not everyone always believed that so it's it's a way to look at things a little bit differently so yeah I like to read about history quite a bit it's one of my favorite things I like to do for some reason the movie Valhalla Rising came to my mind have you ever seen that one? no I haven't what was that about? ah um it's got Mad Mickelson in it. You know, the star of Hannibal, the TV series? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was Danish adventure drama. It was set in the, uh, quote-unquote, Dark Ages. I don't believe in the Dark Ages, but... I don't either. That's a good point. I was going to bring that up. Yeah, was, they did a lot. It was very educated ages, actually. Yeah. I'll have to check it. Yeah, the book I looked it up is A Distant Mirror, uh, Barbara Tuckman. It's very good. It was about the uh, 14th century France. Uh, it's kind of an obscure topic, but it was interesting to see how people lived back then and all the alliances. And, I, you know, you realize, I didn't, well, I, I realized, but you, how much the French and the English really kind of interbred <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> they would, you know, go back and forth. So um, much of France used to be part of England, so... It was it was interesting how those times uh, were, but they were a lot more um, violent, that's for sure, in everyday life, I think. And another thing that changed back then, I, I think has really been lost in Europe, is your religion, right? You guys are no longer Christian, mm -hmm. are you? No, or very much atheist. Yeah, you, you guys don't take it seriously anyway. I'm um, not like Muslims that take their religion seriously. And see, back then, Europe used to always be Christian, and they... They, they took it seriously and I think that gave them a different purpose in life I'm not, I'm not saying I don't believe in it myself but it gave them a sense beyond right now right they looked at something greater a greater purpose besides I guess now we're just about consumerism and watching mm -hmm. porn but and that's why I think the Muslims in a sense they have a greater purpose because they believe in you know they're willing to die for their cause Whereas yeah. most Europeans, I don't think, are willing to die because they go, well, if I die, that's all over then. You know, but they, they would. In the same way, the people in the 14th century France, they all believed in God, and they would die for their cause um, because they had that faith in it. So I think that the loss of religion or Christianity has really been detrimental to uh, Europe in being able to maintain their um, integrity or um, their their sense of being the reason they exist um, 
it kind of binds the country together. I saw that in even Romania. They went back, you know, they were atheists for a long time, but they've gone back. Now they're officially Orthodox Christian. In fact, that's a state religion. It's mm. Not all the people believe in it, but it binds them together, their Orthodox Christianity, just like I assume Catholicism, right, used to bind together Ireland. So, um, yeah, I don't, I think religion served a purpose really that no longer exists in Europe that did very much so. In fact, it's hard to understand modern versus middle age times. In the middle age times, religion was everything. I mean, your seasons, your calendar was based on religious holidays and everything was based on really religion, more than we can understand today, I think. For me, going forward, as a non-Christian, but as a religious person, I'm a personally I'm a pagan. I I look to the idea of seeing something higher than yourself. Uh, I think that's integral to our survival, mm -hmm. uh, as you say. Yeah, I, I've called myself more like a cultural Christian. I don't necessarily believe the stories, but mm -hmm. I think in a sense that Christianity provided a, um, well, someone once described it, and I kind of like this analogy. You think of an orange, and inside the orange, that's like the fruit, the good part, right? That's the stuff you really want to eat. And then you have the outer skin, and you don't eat the outer skin. But you, you know, and you think, well, why don't we just get rid of the outer skin then? Why do we even have it on the trees? But the outer skin, it protects the fruit. And a lot, someone described mm. religion, at least the goal of religion, is to be like that outer skin. Okay, it may not really be good in itself, but it, it kind of protects and gives order to the good things in a society. And I can see some a lot of truth in that. So, um, yeah, because I know, yeah, the Christianity, you know, there's a lot of corruption in the church and all that sort of stuff. But it did provide a framework that unified people um, somewhat anyway in Europe. In fact, you can't really talk about Western civilization without talking about Christianity if you read the history. I mean, they're really interrelated. Or religion in general at all. Yeah, it'd be like talking about the Middle East now without talking about religion or Islam, right? Because it's so interrelated into their life that it's, it's you can't really, you know, divorce from it. You know, how do you talk about people, Muslims, without Islam? I mean, that's what they are, and so it's... Well, it's, I mean, you know, also, sorry to cut you off, but also the Chinese without uh, whatever it is they've got going on. There's a mishmash going on there. And the Japanese, with their particular brand of Buddhism, without that, they're kind of, you know, going off in kind of queer directions. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. So I think that's another thing that has changed in Europe quite a bit. Um, interestingly enough, I would think America is still a lot more Christian than Europe, at least people that believe in it. But Christianity has taken some strange turns here. <laughs> we have... I'm in the south here. That I'm like a ground zero where we have a lot of this Christian Zionism, meaning we think oh. Israel is prophesied in the Bible, and you know, for Jesus to come back, we need to defend Israel, then Jesus will come back and rapture everyone and all that sort of shit. But people really believe that. And so that's we need to defend the Jews because we're God's chosen people. Christians believe this. So a lot of the warmongering, seriously, is just not the Jews, but the Zionist Christians in America that believe that this will help Jesus to come back. I know it sounds insane, but it's true. It is insane because uh, <laughs> in, a, in a Louis Theroux documentary, I witnessed Christians harvesting, I, I think, grapes for an Israeli farmer, a, a winery, mm -hmm. for free. Because the Torah said that the Christians should harvest the grapes. And the Christians were going along with this. Yeah, yeah, I can believe it. There's that, there's a really pro Jewish sentiment with the Christians here, um, with the Protestantism anyway. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, um, it's really strange. It is <laughs> strange. Really it's so strange. Why would you be slaves? 
Yeah, well, if there's a history that came out of the Schofield Bible and all that, and seeing the United States really wasn't part of Catholicism, so and Protestantism wasn't really unified, so that a lot of weird sects popped up out of the United States, and uh, that's kind of the history behind that. So, but like I was saying, in religion, I think more people here would call themselves Christians and do go to church and do actually believe in Jesus and God and the basic story than most people in Europe. So that is that is true. Um, not that that changes their behavior necessarily, but they just ask Jesus for forgiveness the next day. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of how it works. <laughs> so. Yeah. So how many, what percent of the Irish people attend church? Is, is it pretty low? It has dropped dramatically since the 80s. It has taken a nosedive right to the ground. And particularly after the whole Catholic priests touching boys thing. Yeah. Yeah, very, very few Catholics going to church these days. And, and so as a whole, because I think this was more in the 70s, or maybe it was overblown, but you, we always heard that the, one of the root causes of the Irish conflict was the Protestants versus the Catholics, right? Is that all done now because no one cares either way? <laughs> I mean, would you mind if you, if you had a neighbor that was a Protestant? Would you be, like, mad at them, or you, no one cares anymore? Um, to To... From the outset, to give you a bit of perspective, that question doesn't actually make any sense to me. So, to you know, to answer your question directly, um, when it comes to the Catholic Protestant situation, it's more of that was representative of. A more deeper conflict between people because That's what I thought, yeah. yeah the introduction of the Protestant stack was really British and Scottish settlers that were sent into the north you have some Protestants in the south but they were originally English who were you know barons and lords who decided that they would prefer to live in Ireland and rule over the place from, you know, on site, while most would prefer to live in England and rule from a distance, some Protestants moved into Ireland. So the distinction between Protestant and Catholic is cultural at this stage. They would call each other Catholic or Protestant, and you know, if you had the wrong kind of thing around your neck, you know, a little kind of medallion or something, mm -hmm. then you could get into trouble in Belfast if you walked down the wrong street. That's pretty much the extent of it. it you know, the narrative of Catholic versus Protestant is really overblown. Right. Yeah, I would think so now, especially as people don't take that as seriously anymore. <laughs> Get mm. upset at someone because they don't recognize the Pope. Who cares, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it shows like the different people because I remember uh, Duke Wellington. He was born in Ireland, but he never considered himself Irish. <laughs> in fact, he said being born in a stable doesn't make you a horse. <laughs> <laughs> That was his actual quote. He didn't like the Irish. <laughs> so. Oh, that is, yeah, that is dark and offensive. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they, they said some offensive things about the Irish back then, though. So. <laughs> yeah, that was I personally like my stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a nice little aisle, so I hope you guys can keep it. <sighs> yeah. Well, for that, we depend on the support of our British, our French, and our German allies. And that's the crux of this, you know. We, we, I myself am an identitarian. Uh, the people that I work with on this radio station 
we identify as identitarian Irish. But I personally would think that it involves a a global um, alliance of identitarian movements. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, from your personal opinion, all that you've learned from all the places that you've been and the people you've spoken to, what would be your advice to an Irish identitarian who is trying to get a movement started? That's a good question. And one of the things I was, when you were starting to preface that question, I was thinking as an American, how much this may sound weird, but I, I'm just like, I feel sad because I don't, it's almost like I don't have an identity. You know, I, you could say, um, Scottish, but like you said, you don't want to recognize an Irish guy, right? In America, as being one of you, and I don't think the Scottish would recognize me because I've my family hasn't been there since we we were here in the 1600s, so it's been a long time. So I don't think they would recognize us. So in America, it's a little different for us to have an identity. But the places I've been in, like Hungary, their really strong identity is their culture, their language, and everything. And I think it's just to network with people like that and hold on to really what makes you Irish or what makes you Hungarian and uh, support that in a, uh, a kind of in a positive way. So it's not hatred for other people, but it's a, a it, you, you just affirm who you are. And it, if you think about it, it really keeps diversity in the world. Because if everyone is all together, it, it all blends together, right? We become this globalist thing of corporations or whatever, just blobs of humanity, you know, like widgets, right? Just resources that can be interchanged. But with identity, you have your own identity that's unique and it's, it's, it's cool, right? You have your own songs, your history, your language, your folk. Uh, uh, your tales and everything and I think that's it's important to hang on to that you can still be in the modern world it doesn't mean you have to you know walk around in a um, I don't know did the divers have kilts like the Scots no 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 that was just the Scots right okay I didn't yep. know if you did that too okay but so anyway so you know if you're a Scottish identity, it doesn't mean you have to walk around in kilts, but you can mm -hmm. still kind of hang on to that identity that where you came from. The Hungarians do that with their identity. They have their dance and everything, but they're still very modern. And I think that's an important thing is to kind of hang on to what you were. And I think it's important because I think, you know, we're talking about having a purpose in life. I think it's important to have that identity. And that even some of our customs, our religious customs, even if you don't believe in the religion, you know, Christmas is important and all these things of really what brought us together. So um, I think that's really the, the key. And again, like an American, I kind of miss that because the American, we're such a younger nation. We really don't really have so much that identity. So I'm kind of a man without a uh, country in a way. So. <laughs> Maybe someone will adopt me somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> you know, the more I hear from you Americans, the more I hurt for you that, you know, there's no homeland for you to come to. Yeah, and some people I, I really, I, I'm friends with, in fact, that are Americans, but they their their ancestry is Hungarian. In fact, I know two people like that, that were, one guy, he was actually remembers, he was a kid, he's six, six years old, I believe, during the 56, he remembers the Soviet tanks out front of the side of his um, uh, window, he saw, he can remember that, he remembers Whoa. when they, uh, you know, bodies in the streets, the whole bit, and, and then they fled Hungary. Uh, one time they got sent back and they tried again. They had to bribe the guards. So they're risking being killed, but they got through and they got to the West. But he grew up ever since as a kid in the United States. But because he has that Hungarian ancestry, he can go back. He's a Hungarian citizen too and an American citizen. This other girl I knew, she was same situation. She's younger, but because her parents were Hungarian, she now lives in Hungary, even though she's an American speaks like me, you know, our accent, but she can go back to Hungary. So some of those nations, they do have that kind of right of return, I guess, like the Jews to Israel. But I guess you Irish don't have that for the Irish. <laughs> so, but yeah, so that's, that's some of the issue with some of us. We don't have that. So I kind of miss that. Sad. Oh, well. <clears throat> so um, the last question on my associate producers uh, sorry 
uh, I forget his title. I'm too drunk. Anyway, <laughs> the last question <laughs> he has. Um, is that the assistant producer or the, pro- uh, there you the go. assistant to the producer? Assistant. Yep. <laughs> There's two guys on the team. Yep. All right. <laughs> okay, so he asks, given that according to the Lisbon Treaty, Article 20, sorry, 42.7 states that all NATO members should come to the aid of another member state which is the victim of an act of war, are you apt optimistic about the future of Europe given that a new form of war may be on the horizon? Uh, the new form of war being terrorism, you mean? or Yeah, I gather that's what he's saying here. Because I think really that the new form of war is what that guy – and check out The Camp of the Saints if you, get, you can read that book. But the new form of war is invading a country not with weapons but just by walking in it. <laughs> that's what they're doing. So, um, yeah, and uh, I, I think that will be interesting how people can respond to it. But, I mean, that comes down to basically a more – fundamental thing and I think we started the conversation off with Israel right they don't take any refugees because they want to keep Israel Jewish and so the the, the question is do you guys want to keep Ireland Irish and should hung, Hungary remain Hungarian that's a fundamental question and if you answer no then you won't exist anymore right because the people come in and take it over and they'll transform it into something radically different not saying it's good or bad, but that's what will happen. So that's the first question: is you guys want to continue to exist as a people? And if you don't, you don't want to, or you don't have the spiritual wherewithal to, you know, fight for that, then you will just disappear. And that's just the way of history, though. So, am I optimistic? I'm optimistic about some countries. Yeah, I think some will resist, and others will fall. In a way, the European Union has um, stood in the place of the Celtic Empire and the Roman Empire and has kind of held Europe, Europe together as a continent. So, you know, maybe we might actually see a unified response. Maybe, but I don't even know if Europe, I'm talking Brussels, the EU, if they think in those terms, because I think they think of Europe as being whoever migrates there, right? So if Mm. like 100 million Africans should just flood in and they're Europeans in their point of view, whereas again, like Israel, when I consider that, you know, millions of Muslims flooding in to be part of their citizens because they're not Jewish, or Japanese when I consider a bunch, you know, a million white guys moving in there to be Japanese. So... But, you know, the EU has such a kind of a globalist mindset. I don't know if they have a sense of defending who they really are. So I don't know. We'll have to see. I think the best part would be to dissolve the EU and have the independent nation states again. Uh, I don't know if that will happen. Maybe. I don't know. Do you think the EU will survive or will it, there's been rumblings of it breaking apart? The EU is damned because eventually – no matter what course, no matter what timeline you follow, it's fucked. It's gone. Mm -hmm. It's a failed experiment. Unless, of course, they come in with the military police. We have the legislation in place where, you know, German troops can serve in France, French troops can serve in uh, Ireland. So we've lost that kind of brotherhood where like I I was told once that by a commander in the Irish military that Irish troops will never shoot at Irish civilians but that's different if you have French troops in Ireland Mm -hmm. and we now have military police in Europe which you know they're going to feel free to enforce the European law, but you know I, I I'm going to admit here I'm a new ager in a kind mm-hmm. of you know in one sense of the word in that I always look to the positive mm-hmm. I always look at the silver lining. 
this will not go any further than tyranny. It'll just fall under its own weight. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, God knows what will happen because it's up to us. It's up to you. It's up to me and our listeners. Yep. We have to define the future. Because it's a current year, 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're living in the now. <laughs> that's just a meme that's kind of mocked. <laughs> uh, did you see that Pepe? Um, 1993 was 30 years ago. Oh, no, I'll have to look at Google that. That'd be funny. It originated yeah. from the bodybuildingforums.com oh, okay, where yeah. in 2013 someone posted 1993 was 30 years ago. Oh my god. <laughs> Let's take a look at that. Yeah, because that's, a, that's a, kind of the current meme people are making fun of now. And I think the guy, the new president of uh, Canada, actually used it in all seriousness. He wasn't being satirical. It's 2015. That's why we're doing this policy. <laughs> this was kind of the running joke. You know, it's the current year. That's why we're doing this. You know, it's, it's as, as, hmm. as though that's a justification. But, you know. That can be used by anyone. That's the beauty. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I wonder if they used that, the Normans used that. Why are we invading? Because it's 1066, that's why. <laughs> Get with the program. <laughs> that's when they invaded, right? 1066, I forget. I think that was it. As far as I can recall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bastards. <laughs> can I ask you about Christianity? Yes, go ahead. Well, Christianity, I mean, it pretty much, you know, as, as a white nigger, as an Irishman, uh -huh. I, I, you know, I repel Christianity. I'm a pagan. Uh -huh. I don't like it. I think it's what was the proto-white supremacy, you know, it was the idea of one king above them all. You know, the, the idea of a pope, the highest king above all kings. Mm -hmm. do, do you see that as problematic at all? Well, it's hierarchical, and the Middle Ages were hierarchical and more traditional, and not egalitarian. So, yeah, I mean, it, it served its as, as purpose in that sense. Um, and of course, you know, the history, if you study history, the kings always had conflicts with the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire and all that. And, well, you guys are familiar, not you, Ireland, but, you know, England, right? Um, they started a new religion because someone wanted to get married to his mistress, right? <laughs> Henry VIII and Boylan. <laughs> the Pope well, wanted an annulment marriage, it, so he, uh, yeah. In fairness now. That's just as credible as the claim that the Civil War in America was about slavery. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was. There's probably more to it than that. I know about the. Uh, I, I read a book about Henry VIII too. It was kind of fascinating. So yeah, but that was anyway. Supposedly one of the things because right, he was married to the Catherine. What right? That was his first. Wife, I believe she's from Spain or something. And then um, he mm -hmm. got this this floozy Anne Boleyn, this hottie that he met in France. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, and see back then you could kind of fuck around if you were married. No one really cared if you're the king. You just the issue was if you wanted to marry him and have legitimate heirs. And I think Anne Boleyn, she wanted to say, hey, you know, if you want to have sex with me, I want to have legitimate children. So he was pressuring to get a divorce from Catherine. Because, yeah, I don't know. I, I think his brother was pledged to be married to Catherine, but they never consummated it, and then his brother died or something. So that was his out. So yeah. people buy, died. Yeah, they died quick back then. So, but yeah, so he formed a. That's how he got the Church of England, basically, out of that. But going forward, 
mm-hmm. you, you could never have a Christian West. It's, it's impossible. Is it necessary to move forward? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's one of the things that, that's one of the, the big, uh, it's kind of funny how that always comes back, the religious debate, even in the alt-right movement, that can really get people to really upset one way or the other, the Christians versus the non-Christians. It happened in uh, NPI, Richard Spencer, I don't know if you know who he, who he is, but he's in the alt-right, and he's he's like you, he's, a, I think, a pagan, or, but um, there was a lot of Christians in the movement, and there was a lot of debate about who he invited to his conference and all that sort of thing, so the religious aspect is all there, but I think we need to try to kind of put that behind us as much as possible, which is hard to do, because religion is always kind of fundamental, I know that, so, um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, how that will how that will work because at least in America most of the whites are still Christian so um, yeah but maybe it'd be more of an identity thing kind of like uh, Jews are with Judaism most Jews really aren't they don't believe in their Torah or anything but they they still keep to the form I guess the Orthodox Jews still believe in it but most of the others don't well from what I hear the leaders of the say the Buddhist movement in America are Jewish so it really doesn't come down to religion for the Jews no but... no Jews are a racial group That's, they have DNA tests to tell if you're Jewish most Jews aren't they don't they're not Judaism really so they just have certain things traditions that keep them together like the Holocaust now is probably the big one but yeah So um, I'm uh, you know now that we've uh, you know gotten a lot of gotten a lot of uh, coverage in our discussion here, mm-hmm. I have to admit to you, I have been kind of convinced that you were kind of a white nationalist, a bit of a supremacist. You're. American Renaissance connection kind of worried me, but all this time that I've gotten to know you and this interview that we've had, you're just a normal human being. And I I just have to come out front in a public way to say, well, you're a human being. You <laughs> believe in every human being having their own space and every culture having their own space. Yeah, I, I think that really defines most of the alt-right. And that's why I said early on in the conversations, it's really different from the what I call the 1488. I don't know if you know what that term means, but crowd. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so because they're kind of the the neo-Nazis and all that. And then there's just the normal people that just want self-determination for all people. And unfortunately, a lot of the shills try to uh, kind of connect us, so that's always an endless battle, but what are you going to do about it? So, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of fakes and a lot of crazies, but I think if you went talk to Jared Taylor, you'd be impressed with him too, and uh, a lot of just normal people that just want to, you know, live peacefully with others and have our own identities. So, uh, and honestly i ironically I, I i i'm pro diversity in the world i love going to places like japan and hungary and ireland i like you guys having your own customs and things and uh, i hope you always maintain them you, you know just because i have mine or our people doesn't mean we hate other people's uh ways of living cuz otherwise what's the point in traveling Exactly. I don't want. And that, in fact, I, I, this, it always just drives me crazy too. <laughs> no offense, but whenever I go to a foreign country and I meet friends or everything, the first thing they want to bring me to is like, "Hey, let's go to a McDonald's." I'm like, "No, I don't uh. want to go to McDonald's." It's just like they think because I'm American, I eat there every night. I'm like, "No, I don't. Just don't take me there." <laughs> right? I think they want to make me feel at home or something. It's so bizarre that happened in. Bucharest of all places. I'm like, no, I don't want to go to McDonald's, you know, but they think it'd be nice. So, <laughs> if, if I ever come to Ireland to meet you, let's, let's not go to McDonald's. 
I, I assume you have a McDonald's, don't you? But, oh, plenty. And, yeah. you know, they all look the same. And exactly. we even have Subway and anything you could imagine. We have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. I hate, but, that's you the know, thing I hate. If you were to come to Ireland, I'd make you bacon and cabbage. That's what I'd do. Okay. We gotta get a pint, right? I wanna have a, a pint in a pub. Right, yeah, okay. We'll have a woman at home make the bacon and cabbage, and then we'll go out for a pint and then go and make, uh, go and eat what she made. That's Excellent. the do Irish have, way. Do they have serving wenches still, or is that the old term? I, I'd like to have serving That's wenches. Very old. Oh, very darn old. it. <laughs> You're, just, you're you know, way picture. out of historical context here. All right, I was just thinking of my historical games I like to play. Maybe role-playing games, you know, I see buxom serving winches, you know, give you... <laughs> Rats! <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but hey, you know, if you ever come to Ireland, give me a buzz, I'll treat you well. I will, yeah. And you don't have much of an Irish accent, this little bit. You gotta, you gotta. When I go visit, you'll have to turn that up to impress me. <laughs> you know, I get that a lot. Anyone else in the world, they think I'm American. Americans no. think I'm Canadian. It's very yeah. weird. Yeah, you kind of do sound Canadian a little bit. Yeah, you don't have that traditional heavy Irish accent that we love. So, oh well. That's how multicultural Ireland is, okay? I'm an example yeah. of how fucked up my country is. Right, yeah. Well, that's we're having to have in the United States. I mean, we're losing the southern accent. I mean, I don't have really a southern accent, do I? Yeah, a little. Okay. Yeah, well, oh yeah, I'll definitely tell you're from South America, yeah. Yeah. We say th some things like y'all. Sometimes I do that when I forget, but yeah. <laughs> it's colorful. Yeah, it's our colorful traditions. Y'all yeah, come over here. <laughs> we'll be fixing to go get some grits. <laughs> I don't know if you know what grits are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. Now, every time a guest comes on, I ask them to play a game with me, right? Okay. Okay, it's called the Idiot Lottery. Or, sorry, right. the Idiot Tax, right? Okay. You know, you play the lottery, right? You're an idiot. Uh -huh. Well, right. I play the lottery. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the Idiot Tax is, you know, you give up five, ten euro every week, and it goes to charities, blah, blah, blah. There's a very slim chance that you might actually get something back out so mm -hmm. before I enter my numbers into the website to check if I'm a winner or not I'd like you to name a local charity of your choice that I will donate half of my winnings to hmm <laughs> I guess the Ramsey Paul Institute really want to be a charity <laughs> 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 I'll have to. I know. I'll give you a real politically incorrect uh, charity. You can you can donate to the NRA, National Rifle Association. <laughs> <laughs> that will trigger everyone over there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Half of my winnings to the NRA. You could Let's you could see. probably wear you, you know wear your NRA badge in Ireland. <laughs> And I'll send you over the stars and bars, the Confederate flag. That's not actually the Confederate. That's the battle flag, but yeah, that's uh, what most people know. Yep. And you can s sing Dixie. <laughs> Could you imagine how butt hurt I would be if I won two million euro? Holy shit! No, you don't have to give it to it. You can just, you know, that's fine. It's not like you, you know, expect to actually do it. So. <laughs> That's a, that's a, actually an old Southern uh, folk thing that we're told about. Two good old boys were sitting on the porch, and um, the guy says, you know, Haas, you know, I really love you as a brother. And he, he goes, oh, you do? He goes, yeah, if I had, 
if I was a millionaire and two had two homes, I'd give you one. He goes, oh, really? Thanks. And he goes, yeah. And if I had like two Cadillacs, I'd give you one. You know that. You're like my brother. He goes, yeah, I know that. Thank you. And he says, well, Leroy, would you give me a pig? I said, Haas, that's not a fair question. You know I have a pig. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning you're, you're willing to give away something you don't have. Right? <laughs> so, <that's... laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. I like that Yeah, there's some southern folklore there for you, so there's a lot of truth in that. A lot. All right, I'm about to All hit right. the button to check the All numbers. Right. All right, well, have a good beer, and uh, thanks for having me on your show, and hello to Ireland. I, I do like your Irish people, especially the pretty girls, fair skin and red hair, right? Mm -hmm. All right, well, if it means right. anything to you, I didn't win anything on the lotto. All right. All right, Audio. well... Have a good night. Bye. All right. Ramsey Paul. <laughs>